showtime. Let's go, let's go, let's go. It's one of the most misunderstood jobs in Hollywood. Stop, stop. But what does a producer do? All the comedy lines I'm going to avoid <laughs> about what a producer does. I'll let someone else tackle those. One of the things you know is they're in your way. Buys lunch <laughs> for the crew. <laughs> Seriously, it is a demanding job. I agree, I agree. I can't think of any other thing that one can do that uses every part of you. From the set of Spider-Man... Roll sound. ...to the making of Futurama... It has to be better than perfect. Oh. We'll take you inside the biz to meet the biggest producers around and reveal their professional secrets. So, uh, here's the hard question. Yes. When? Right now. Oh, dance, puppet dance. Stay tuned as we solve the mystery of what is a producer. And I think she's excuse me. That's <laughs> <I've> <laughs> what is a producer? What do they really do? Hi, I'm John Cryer, and uh, being both an actor and a producer myself, I can tell you that the answer to that question is not as simple as you may think. Now, to get the most complete definition of what a producer is, we've gone way inside and far behind the scenes with the biggest and best producers in both film and television to hear from the people who do the job every day. Let's start with the movies. Action! Producers are in the business of transforming dreams into reality. I feel obligated to entertain an audience, uh, to give them a good time, to move them emotionally. Uh, you know, that's the fun of it. And when they walk out, they, they know they went through an experience, and hopefully it was a good experience. Jerry Bruckheimer, whose film credits include Armageddon and Con Air, knows what it takes to be a successful producer. I'm in the transportation business. I try to transport them from one place to another uh, and take them on a real emotional ride. And if I can give them a great ride, believe me, they'll come back. But what exactly does a producer do? Anything that the movie requires to get made. They can be the originator of the idea, the passionate finder of the writer to bring that story to the screen, the person that finds the right director, the actors. It's a person who brings everything together. Because I don't hold this camera, or I don't, you know, build the sets, and I don't call action, and I don't act in the movie, and I don't write the script, it's much harder to define what a producer does. Currently in production on the big screen adaptation of Spider-Man, Laura Ziskin is familiar with the demands of producing. I'm responsible for everything. It's such a complex endeavor on all fronts. And, you know, movies, they are a unique endeavor. I can't think of any other thing that one can do that uses every part of you. You know, you're, you have to use your taste, your intuition, your diplomatic skills, your stamina, your uh, everything. But nothing is more important than the producer's ability to communicate ideas. A producer is, is the person that stands between the creative head of the project, the director, and the financier of the project, the bank, the studio, um, trying to bridge that gap and make sure that the movie that we're making is the movie that they're buying. Howard Hawk Koch, whose credits include frequency and keeping the faith, knows that good communication is also vital on set. I try to know what everybody's job is in every different department. And they come to me, and I'm able to give them answers. I'm able to put out fires, prep, so that the director every day has everything in front of him that he wants in order to make the best movie and give him as much time as possible to have stuff on camera instead of waiting for things that should have been ready. You cannot be off much there. You cannot make many mistakes because it is his ass is on the line, basically, because it's him that has to justify to the studio executives and to the head of the studio a lot of times, well, we need this extra money. The reason why we went over 10 days was because of this, this, and that, and all this. So he's the one that really is in charge of the entire thing. And that huge responsibility means long days for the producer. I definitely have my, uh, my finger involved in everything from initial concepts to development of screenplays to casting to shooting to post-production and to marketing. I'm very involved with movies from beginning to end. Neil Moritz, who produced I Know What You Did Last Summer and Cruel Intentions, is sometimes responsible for up to six projects at a time. I really see everything that happens on each of the movies. Like, you know, today I'll leave the set and I'm, I'm going to go to 
to Universal where I've got to see some of the dubbing that we're doing on this movie, The Fast and the Furious, that I have coming out in June. And then um, tonight I'll go back and I'll watch dailies. And I'm able to constantly, you know, stay in touch with my office through you know, instant email and phones. And I have people run stuff out to set to me all day so I can kind of see what's going on. Getting a film made is only part of the battle. Getting people to the theater is really the biggest challenge. You want to give them a, a, you know, a real movie experience and show them something that they haven't seen as many times before and to get them away from their computer, away from their TV set, away from their, their, their videos and DVDs. That's a real challenge for all of us. Dan Jinks and Bruce Cohen feel very fortunate that they beat the odds with American Beauty. We're very proud of everything that we did with American Beauty, but in any case, when something works that well, you can make a great movie and audiences don't go see it. In this case, not only do they see it in the United States, but but they saw it in even greater numbers around the world. I mean, just again and again and again, it continued to surprise people, and, and uh, it was just a wonderful, wonderful journey for us. It's always a challenge to try and figure out what it is that people want to see, um, and yet at the same time, I think that's probably the worst way to approach uh, making a movie or telling a story. For me, what I try and do is make a determination as to what it is that really interests me, um, whether that would be the arena of World War II for Saving Private Ryan or, say, the American Revolution um, for the Patriot. Talk about the kind of stories that you want to tell. Uh, think about the kind of movies that you want to make and then go for it. Sometimes going for it can create enormous challenge, as Mark Gordon found out when he made Hard Rain. This was a story that was set in a small Midwestern town against the backdrop of a flood. And in trying to figure out how we were going to shoot this, um, it posed enormous problems. We ultimately ended up building a tank inside a gigantic hangar that is used to build the B-2 bomber. We built a tank that was one football field wide by almost uh, three football fields long. It was the most difficult physical production I've ever had. When we drained the tank, we found about 85 walkie-talkies in there. Also, you can imagine the humidity that was in this place. It really started to smell pretty bad after, after about 40 days when we were barely halfway through the production. I think we get an A for sort of difficult of production. Unfortunately, the audience doesn't really care how difficult it was. They just want to, you know, feel good about the movie, which I think is terrific, but uh, it didn't quite do as well at the box office as we had hoped. During more than 25 years of producing, David Brown has learned to have realistic box office expectations. Until you see a movie with a first paying audience, you don't know a thing. You know if it's good, but you don't know if it's going to be popular because that's a secret that's been kept from us. No amount of research will tell us that in advance. Coming up, Survivor producer Mark Burnett pieces together the Australian outback. It's really a, like a jigsaw puzzle where you have 10,000 pieces, but you only really need 500 pieces. Plus, Arnold Schwarzenegger pays respect to the producer. It's one thing to read the script and to just look at it and say, yeah, we can do this, this, that, but you have to have someone dissect the script, storyboard it out, know exactly what the obstacles could be. And Danny DeVito reveals the secret of success. So if you want to be a producer, you go to the chiropractor, Hello, welcome back to E's Inside Look at What is a Producer. I'm John Cryer. Now, a producer's biggest responsibility comes before even a frame of film is shot. It's called pre-production. And in the beginning, there's no cast, no crew, no money, and no script. There is only a producer and a telephone. Hi, Michelle. It's Deborah. The biggest challenges for producers is finding the material. You have to be really innovative. You just can't let it... It doesn't come to you. You have to really go out and look for the material and find stories that you feel have universal appeal. It's having a dream, uh, getting a story, getting the financing, getting the director, getting the cast. And that takes a long time, sometimes up to five years, which is what Jersey film producers Stacy Scher and Michael Schamberg endured trying to get Aaron Brockovich to the big screen. The project was actually found by my wife, who's an executive at the company, who met the real Aaron Brockovich through her chiropractor. Carla was in a chiropractor, and you know, 
couple of women in a chiropractor office, you know, and they start talking to each other. So Aaron Brockovich, Carla Schamberg are talking to each other, and this is the result. That's this is true. good. You so if you want to be a producer, you go to the chiropractor and you keep your ears open. We had both of us worked with uh, Steven Soderbergh on Out of Sight, so we enlisted Steven to direct it. So it's like an old team coming together. But the development of the script was about five years. Yeah. So it's really having the perseverance to see something when other people don't necessarily see it. With one Academy Award and five nominations, Aaron Brockovich proved its worth. But Michael and Stacy aren't resting on their laurels. They're already in preparation for their next project. There is some of the third man, and there is some of the of double indemnity. And it's a project called VDOC, which is a real life story about a crime fighting society in Philadelphia composed of amateurs with an interest in crime, like pathologists and psychologists who take cold cases and solve them. I'm also just so excited about, uh, about this society and showing what this society really is and how interesting and diverse these people are who live among the ghosted dead people. Well, the great thing is also because the people in the society aren't full-time, you know, police or criminologists, so it's partly like a hobby, you yes. know, and thus they represent the audience in a way, the people who wish they could be out solving a crime, and so they sort of stand in for us. It's kind of a cool angle. So uh, here's the hard question. Yes. When? Uh, soon. Really soon. Uh, a couple of soon weeks. Like uh, week? Soon, like last week? Soon, like a couple of weeks. When you said soon? No, soon, like uh, a couple of weeks soon. You heard this on national television. <laughs> Yes, okay. absolutely. Thanks. Getting a script is an integral part of the process, but without a cast, a project is going nowhere. Getting actors attached is always difficult. You're always competing against other movies and trying to get the timing right. Bonnie Bruckheimer, who's been producing for close to 20 years, knows that the project has to sell itself to the actors. Her latest project, The Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood, attracted an A-list of actors. We were able to get Ellen Burstyn to play Vivi, who was the main Yaya. She's a brilliant, brilliant actress, so we were thrilled beyond belief to have her. And she basically loved the script, and, uh, and it was a great part for her. The younger Vivi is being played by Ashley Judd. She met Callie Corey and knew that Callie was going to be a, a terrific director. Sandy Bullock, who's, we all know, one of the biggest box office names and greatest actresses around, is a really good friend of Callie's and loved what Callie had done with the character of Sita, who was the modern day character in the book, and agreed to play that part. Strong relationships with actors are just a small part of the selling process. Unless you have the goods, it doesn't matter what your relationship is. I mean, even though Sandra Bullock is good friends with Callie Corey, I think if the script weren't as good as it were, she would never have agreed to do it. So relationships are great. It's nice to be able to get people on the phone, but unless you got the goods, you're not going to get the actor. <laughs> Still to come, NYPD Blues' Stephen Bochco on the dark side of producing. If it doesn't work, you, you know, you get your head handed to you. Linda Obst orchestrates the finishing touches on her film, Someone Like You. Well, today's our biggest scoring day, which means there's about 150 musicians here today. And Laura Ziskin gets tangled up in Spider-Man's web. Just give me the biggest mother you got. <laughs> Clear the background. Shut that door, please. Okay, the script is written and the actors have been cast, but when there's a problem on the set, who does everyone turn to? Here's an inside tip. Don't bother the director. Roll sound. Once you're shooting, I always feel like I have to be here because if I'm not here, and then I come to dailies the next day, I think, what, they do that? Ah, ha, ha. You know, little things that, the little contributions that you make through the day. I actually find it invigorating. Laura Ziskin is a producer who loves to test her skills. I said, just give me the biggest mother you got. <laughs> I was looking for a challenge. I got one. What she got was Spider-Man. This is definitely not like anything I've ever done before, and I wasn't a, a Spider-Man geek. I loved what the story was about, the human side of it. Laura knows how important it is for a producer to be on set. We're in this genetics lab, and it's where Peter Parker is bitten by the spider. And we came in, and the spiders in the dialogue were different from a video that we had made to go up on these monitors. It didn't match. So 
was like this crisis yesterday. Oh no, what do we do? So those kinds of things, you know, that's my, I go, oh, okay, so I have to solve it. The star and the director appreciate Laura's support. She's very thorough and makes sure that what we're gonna go into, like that a set is propped properly according to some new script change. A lot of work on the script, you know, supervising the writing, putting in ideas, uh, supervising the costume, making sure it's up to the standards that she has, particular uh, in, in her mind, particular scenes, making sure the spirit of the film is right. I see Laura and Sam as pretty much partners in the thing, and she's very involved with with the story and the characters and, and all that. So if I have some questions, you know, I'll talk to Laura as well as Sam about them. Being available to everyone with a question is only one of a producer's many duties during a shoot. Neil Moritz, currently producing Not A Teen Movie, knows his number one priority is to solve problems. Movie making is all about variables and you have, you know, 30 variables every day and you're just trying to keep everybody headed in the same direction and trying to make really good decisions about, you know, what adjustments or changes you'll have to make on a daily basis to, you know, fit within the budget, schedule, and creatively what you want to put on screen. Danny, where's first team? First team, coming in. We've been having to make a lot of decisions over the last week or two about whether we're going to stay with our existing schedule or kind of move inside to what we call cover sets. It has a big impact because we only have a certain amount of cover sets we can use each movie, and you don't want to exhaust them in the first two weeks of principal photography. And action! But yesterday, actually, when we were looking at weather reports for today, we made a conscious decision that we were going to go for it today, even though it looked like about a 50% chance of rain. Uh, we just made the decision if it rained, we were going to shoot it, and if it didn't rain, we were going to shoot it. Okay. Which There's something that happens on a set when everything comes alive and, and you know, they say action that you just can't prepare for. And if you're not there, then you can't take advantage or you can't help take advantage. Yeah, I think. So once you've taken care of the problems, you have to keep the space in your brain to be able to look at the whole picture and see, is there any magic that we can put in that will make this go better? Susan Arnold and Donna Roth have been producing together for almost 10 years. We started off best first, friends first right. and decided to work together. So our first reason for working together was, you know, we could spend the whole day together. It's that type of companionship that the two producers try and cultivate throughout the set. That's that was great. That's exactly the That's script. great. It's really the director's vision of the film, yeah. which will be the same vision that we have. And then it is our job to help the director make that vision come true by hiring people around and by creating a, a set, by creating a foundation of trust. And that foundation comes from one source. We're um, mothers. I, I think that is the I most do. important uh, background that we could have as producers. I'm not kidding. Because we're nurturing, but we're firm, we're strong, we're clear. You know, we know how to say no. Um, we know how to give in mm -hmm. if we need to. Right. We know how to talk somebody into something, uh, you know, and um, but stop them from hurting themselves. <laughs> this is really important as a mother and a producer. Right. In order to mold a creative atmosphere on set, the producer must be the go-to person on a daily basis. Take, for example, Hawk Koch on the set of his movie, Collateral Damage. I got here at 7, and we had a meeting, uh, storyboards with the visual effects supervisor, the uh, regular effects, the special effects, because we're going to blow up something in these tunnels tomorrow, big sequence in the tunnels. So that was from 7 to 9. Then 9 o'clock, I came over here, I put out whatever fires there are, discuss, make sure. For instance, this morning, the first thing the director asked me, well, all right, who, who takes care of getting the fire trucks for me? Got that person over, and we decided where the fire trucks were going to go. I'm sorry, is that me? Nope. Collateral Damage star Arnold Schwarzenegger understands the odds that Hawk is up against. A producer cannot call the shots to God and say, I want all sunshine. What are you doing in the middle of lining up a shot? Like right now, we were lining up a shot that we shoot outside, and all of a sudden, big wind comes in. You cannot use the silk screens for lighting and all those things. We have to come inside. Those are changes that a producer has to be aware of very quickly and make the adjustments. Hawk must also make quick decisions on a much bigger issue, money. I've been on the phone with the auditor. 
about where we are, in fact, on the budget, given a week and a half left and how much money we've got left to finish what we've got to do. I'm on the phone with the studio, <laughs> getting ready, because we go to Washington for one day of shooting. So I've been looking at pictures of Washington, finding out what day we can actually shoot in some place in Washington. Those are just, and it's 10 o'clock in the morning, and we're just starting. Action. Keeping track of a million details is a big responsibility. But Gail Ann Hurd, the producer of Clock Stoppers, makes it a priority to keep distractions to a minimum. Oftentimes, it's trying to deal with crises before they happen, to anticipate what the studio might say, what they might be concerned about, deal with them, and uh, make sure that the director doesn't have to worry about issues that would take him or her away from the creative choices that they make on a daily basis. Gail's hard work does not go unnoticed. I've seen good producers, and I've seen bad producers in my, uh, my limited time in this business. But Gail strikes me as clearly smart. So are you fine with that, or should we have her intersperse some? It, I, I think it would look weird think, if we I had think we inconsistent... I think the costumes look yeah. fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's what I told her on your behalf. Yeah, good call. Thank you. But they never call and say, hey, you're under budget, okay. congratulations, or you're under schedule, <laughs> congratulations. No, you generally get the phone calls that say, you know, we're concerned about this, we're concerned about that. It also looks like, knock on wood, we're going to be a day ahead. Have you heard that? No, I didn't know that. That's great. We may wow. wrap out of here tomorrow. Fantastic. You have to really live in the moment, make every decision the right decision, and make sure that the compromises that you're forced to make during the process of shooting a film, that those compromises don't affect the quality. Coming up, Debbie Allen segues from actress and choreographer to producer. You know what? You really have to put on that other hat or that other head rag, honey. Darren Starr brings some sex to the city. Oh! I want to do a real R-rated comedy. And Mark Burnett shows us just how real reality television can be. The emotions are very harsh and very real, and it's looking at the best and worst sides of human emotion. Welcome back to E's Inside Look at What is a Producer. I'm John Cryer. Well, now that the actors have said their lines and the director has submitted his final cut, it is time for the producer to add his or her finishing touches. Producer Linda Obst must see to it that the original vision of her film, Someone Like You, remains constant through the post-production process. I think our biggest responsibility during post-production is making sure that the, um, the changes that we make to the movie benefit the movie enormously. And it's really, it's come out with, it's ended up with great results that way. We're not just making changes to the movie that the audience wants, but we're making changes to the movie that the director understands that are consistent with why we made the movie in the first place. Well, today's our biggest scoring day, which means there's about 150 musicians here today, which is very expensive. Um, it's wonderful to use live musicians more and more as movies' budgets go up. The amount of live musicians go down and you're using synthesizer more and more. So it's a matter of pride to us to be able to use great orchestras and great musicians like this. Linda is a bit like an orchestra conductor as she brings all the elements into harmony. All the processes in post-production, from editing, marketing, seeing all the materials, scoring, they're all incredibly quick. And so you have to be there. If you're not present, you miss being able to have an opinion. So the goal is to know where in the micro schedule the most important days occur and to be present for the most important days. And frankly, that's experience and, um, and good teamwork. While editing her movie, The Old Settler, film and television producer Debbie Allen takes every tweak very seriously. So I was going over continuity. So when you have the director's cut in, you know, you're just going over it and fine-tuning some little things, especially if you've made some changes in the time of a scene, condensed a scene. So we were just changing out a shot. Uh, we could go up to where Quilly is laughing. <laughs> to go into a movie and just to take even one minute out of it could be very critical to performances. To go into a movie and to take out 20 minutes could be the best thing that ever happened to it. So you can't judge, you know, from one movie to the next. Who the fuck is dumber than dirt? 
as a producer, you get a lot closer to saying, okay, this is actually the film that the world is gonna see. As you've seen, a working producer's job is very demanding, but sometimes you'll see someone listed as a producer in the closing credits who didn't have the headaches of the people you've just seen. At some time in Hollywood history, everyone from a star's nanny to a director's granny has been given a producer credit. Obviously, this bothers the real professionals. A producer's role is to maintain the original spirit of the project. You ready, Jess? A big part of our job is protecting the writer's Action. vision. One of the great crimes in Hollywood is sometimes a writer will write a screenplay and then a director will be put on the project to see something completely different than what that writer had intended. The producers look after the writers, but who's looking out for the producers? I think part of the problem is that the producing credit is not one that necessarily has to be earned. It's known as a perk in the industry. They say, well, I'm not going to give you any more money, but I'll give you a producer credit. And everybody goes, oh, wow, I get a producer credit. Unfortunately, you, whether you're actually credited with produced by credit or the executive producer credit or the co-producer credit doesn't have anything to do right now, technically and officially, with the job you've actually done. We have put together a accreditation process, which is very similar to the Writers Guild accreditation process. This process allows the Guild to determine who gets the producer credit. I think that if the Producers Guild really had that authority to determine credits, um, it would be uh, great for the business because it would take a lot of onus off the studios who are giving credits to people who aren't necessarily doing the work. We're hoping that by creating this golden laurel next to people's names that the audiences will know who deserves the credit. Coming up, the intensity of producing a TV drama. We're editing the show today. It airs in three days. Uh, that's insane. But up next, what it takes to produce an animated comedy. A hundred dollars a week! Twenty two take five. A hundred dollars a week! Great, great. <laughs> Hello again, I'm John Cryer. Welcome back to E's Search for the Answer to the Question, What is a Producer? In film, the producer's job begins with a search for a script or a writer, but it's a little different in television where the producer often is the writer. And action! HBO's hit comedy, Sex and the City, chronicles the lives of four single New York women. Writer-producer Darren Starr is the man behind these sexy ladies. In television, because you have to deliver product consistently every week, Writers have become producers, um, which is uh, really terrific. Who wants a wiener? Ooh, girl, I'm trying to get rid of one. I thought I wanted to do a real R-rated comedy, single-camera film comedy without a laugh track that really looks at sex in a comedic way from a female point of view. And that was basically the premise that sold them on the idea. The fact that HBO was not rating driven, it's quality driven. I thought, all right, this is something I'd like to just challenge myself with and step into to say I'm going more for the reviews than the ratings. However, Darren realizes that good reviews are not based on the script alone. As a writer, you can only take something so far, then you need the actors to give it life, and the wrong actors can kill you, and the right actors can elevate what you've done beyond what you hoped it could be. And I think in those cases, Sex and City is a great example. You're throwing them stuff, they're grabbing the ball and taking it somewhere else, and then you look at that, you look at see what they can do, and, and that sort of even inspires you to do other stuff, because you think, wow, okay, they're really going for it. So then I'll like go for it even more and see, if, see what they do with this. Watch your language. <laughs> Here's Lady Where? Ultimately, I think it really does come down to the scripts, and I think that is the most important part of my job, is really uh, delivering the scripts. I wouldn't mind rubbing my success in a few choice faces. Set a course for adventure! Creating an animated comedy is a whole other animal from live action, and nobody knows that better than David Cohen, producer on Futurama. Getting an animated show on the air uh, as a producer is really unbelievably difficult. We have fantastic actors, we have great animators, but really we don't get the feedback that, that actors in a live action show get where they're, they're up on a stage, you can see if lines are working, not working. Bender, uh, stop! Uh, it's a baby! Uh, a baby what? Ow! Really, we have to have more faith in the writing, I think, and, and uh, spend a lot of a lot more time probably on the early stages of the process. And try one of these popsicle sticks. They've absorbed quite a bit of flavor. Hey, look. And it's perfect. That's perfect. Two more. Perfect! Two more! 
For me as a producer, 75% of my attention probably is on the writing of the show. The rest of my time I spend doing things like editing. I do a lot of editing, <laughs> a lot of uh, 2 a.m. editing sessions, and the sound mixing, directing the actors sometimes, and just generally worrying about all the aspects of the show. All right, so we've got Katie Seagal here doing ADR, which is our uh, additional dialogue record, where she has to actually match the little mouth motions of her character, Leela, on the show. Oh, it's just a card from the orphanarium I grew up in. So Katie, I want to ask you a question. In terms of my abilities as a producer, mm -hmm. how would you rate me? Well, um... Oh, yeah. He's great. <laughs> The animated shows usually take at least nine months from the inception of the, the idea for an episode until it's on the air. The warden would trot you out in front of prospective parents and they'd judge you like a piece of meat. What happens more often is that we'll make a topical joke and by the time the uh, air date rolls around, it'll be long forgotten and we'll be credited as geniuses for making up something that is totally original. No bearing on reality. In the world of live action sitcoms, reality plays an important role. Yvette Lee Bowser has been producing comedy since the late 80s. I became a producer through the writer ranks. Um, I started out as an apprentice writer on a different world 14 years ago. And I worked my way up to producer on that show. And then I produced on Hang With Mr. Cooper. And while I was there, I created Living Single, which I did for five seasons. And while Living Single was wrapping up, I created For Your Love. And here I am, 14 years later, an executive producer. See, the studio on the network, they look to me and they go, dance, club it, dance. And then I come here and I go, dance, club it, dance. And that's how shows get made. The idea for For Your Love basically came from my bathroom. Me and my husband both work really hard, really long hours, and most of our bonding time and get-together time was occurring in our bathroom. So basically stolen moments from my bathroom and scenes from my life were the inspiration for For Your Love. And here we are, neither one of us really cares about how we look or how we dress. What happened to us? <coughs> that I do. <laughs> Yvette also has an on-set rapport with her actors. I enjoy um, that part of the process, working with the actors. I'm not afraid of them. A lot of writer-producers are kind of like afraid, oh, I don't want to touch the actors, you talk to them. Um, but I enjoy kind of getting up close and personal with them and kind of talking to them about how they feel about what it is that they're playing. And it seems to really kind of fuel them and, get, and motivate them to basically get across what I'm trying to convey through the words. Well, I tell her what to do. That's what a producer does. It's kind of one of those careful what you wish for jobs. It's a lot of responsibility. You're in charge of the entire vision of the show. All these people kind of look to you for direction. People call me mother <laughs> on the set. And um, I kind of enjoy that. Still to come, Survivor's Mark Burnett explains the biggest obstacle he faces producing reality television. There's no actual um, script. And the never-ending process of producing one-hour dramas. I always think of a season of television as, as sort of running a marathon. Your whole attitude is informed by the outrage that you have about the fact that if this man is killed, it's because he came into this neighborhood. In your... Producing drama for television is a very, very difficult job, but when it doesn't work, the producer knows exactly who to blame. If the show stinks, it's your fault. It's very difficult. And then if it doesn't work, you, you know, you get your head handed to you anyway. The demands of producing a television drama are unlike any other in the industry. Stephen Bochco, a veteran producer, understands the unique pressures of his job. On NYPD Blue, it is overall, I'm, I'm responsible for all the stories. I supervise the writers. I'm responsible for relations with the network. You're negotiating with actors. You're talking to the network about license fees, your broadcast standards, things will come. You know, whatever, whatever uh, a day-to-day -day activity is generated by having to deliver uh, an, an hour weekly drama to a network. As you can see, guys, we're doing a uh, little documentary here. Uh, studio's done it. It's, uh, it's entitled, What Does Paul Do and Why Does He Need Such a Big Office? <laughs> so, Executive producer of the drama Family Law, Paul Haggis, explains his complex role on the show. The person who does everything and yet nothing. Um, it's, uh, it's a very zen-like uh, uh, state. So I'm thinking we may want to change this today. Scene six, I'm sorry? Yeah. I think you have to know everything 
and then yeah, that's true and then we all pretend to know everything so that works kind of well i'm sorry that's just a typo on our part dennis leone creator of showtime's ethnic drama resurrection boulevard recognizes the upside of executive producing the great thing about being in series television is that the executive producer uh, gets to make the, the final decisions. Uh, I created the show, it's my show, and I want to make sure that we maintain the vision that I originally created. It's very difficult. Uh, that's why I admire guys like, like Bochco and, uh, and uh, who, uh, the, the, to me, the benchmark still is Hill Street Blues. I think probably the most common mis misconception about producers is that we sort of function in a glamorous universe. And, and honestly, nothing is, is, is further from the truth. What time did you guys finish last night? Midnight. Oh, Jesus. We're editing the show today that airs in three days. Uh, that's insane. It happens all the time. Much better, much better. I always think of the season of television as, as sort of running a marathon. You know, when you start, you, you can't even think about the end. It's just too far away. And you know, inevitably, you're going to hit a few walls here. And then at some point, you realize you spy the end. You can see the destination. Producing a successful show takes years of experience and more than a little perseverance. I've worked my way up from the very bottom. You know, once I started writing, then I just got freelance jobs and moved to story editor and co-producer to you know producer supervising producer executive producer of a series of six years i think it was and it lasted uh, two weeks as executive producer <laughs> and i was just out of control i didn't know what i was doing even with all that experience all that little experience depending how you look at it the pressure was too much Get rid of that. Yeah. I, I really like that scene the pressure of producing often begins while facing a blank piece of paper i started out in television as a writer and uh, you know, te television really does a wonderful thing. It empowers writers by making them producers. Uh, and you, you become a producer in television partly to protect your words. It was really Norman Lear who uh, made me into a producer. Uh, I, he made all of his writers into producers, uh, or at least he taught them how to do it. And, uh, and some of us survived, and some of us, like me, got fired. <laughs> We're somewhere in the neighborhood of 170 episodes in. It's 170 hours of storytelling. Same character. The evolution of a squad. You take a step back and you look at this giant tapestry, and you realize that you've created something from a storytelling point of view that has an epic, uh, quality to it, and I think that's genuinely unique to drama, you know, television drama. Up next, Cops producer John Langley weighs in with his take on the current reality TV explosion. It's a very well-executed, well-produced game show. One genre of television has become very popular in recent years. It's called reality TV, and producing it is an experience unto itself. It's a risky business. Network executives can vote you off the island, uh, I mean the network, at any time. And believe me, those bad boys can be a tough audience. So these are the hallowed halls of cops. Reality-based television may seem like an overnight sensation, but the reality of selling the networks on this genre is a whole other story. Just ask John Langley, who has been producing Cops for over 10 years. The hardest thing you do once you have a concept for a show and if you believe in a show is to sell it, to get somebody to buy it. You try to convince people to pay for your show or to fund it. But one of your jobs is to maintain uh, decent, reasonable relations with uh, the networks or wherever, whoever your buyer is. You have to maintain content and satisfy them because ultimately they're the buyer. Mark Burnett, the mastermind behind Survivor, also realizes the importance of a good relationship with the networks. It's really a symbiotic, collaborative thing. Of course, we are making the show, it's our show, but we really welcome their comments on our rough cuts and their comments on casting. 
and our input as a team, so we work as a team. Teamwork is a necessity when it comes to putting a reality show together. It's really a, like a jigsaw puzzle, you know, where you have 10,000 pieces, but you only really need 500 pieces or maybe 200 pieces. And that's a really hard jigsaw puzzle to make. You don't know what to get rid of. Overseeing the editorial process once the footage is shot is part of the producer's job. Organizing where you're going to shoot, when you're going to shoot it, all of the personnel that are attendant and have to be involved in the production. Ultimately, they're all responsible to you, the producer. Keep up the good work. I don't know what you're doing, but I'm all for it. Since reality television is shot entirely on location, it doesn't have the luxury of a controlled set. Cops, for example, is kind of a road show. We go all over the United States because that's part of the mandate, part of the personality of the show. It's showing crime and social issues and a lot of other things in a variety of regions of the United States. So coordinating all of that is the producer's job. Come on, baby. Let's go, Kung Cha. I'm a non-writing producer. I mean, I can have scripts, but it's reality. So it's, it's very, very different in that way. I mean, I'm not sure I could write, even. On the other hand, who knows whether they could deal with the entire mess of 3,000 hours of tape and needed in a haystack and going off to uh, Africa or wherever. It really is an unscripted drama without actors, with real people. And uh, one of my producers from Sky One coined the term dramatity, where drama meets reality. That's very, very real. And the emotions are very harsh and very real. And it's looking at the best and worst sides of human emotion. But just how real is reality television? I've always said I don't think Survivor is pure reality. Pure reality is like cops, probably, where there's a camera in the back of a cop car. The policeman arrests somebody, and they film or tape the action. That's reality. It would have happened with or without the cameras. To me, reality television is something for which you do not have casting calls. It's basically an old-fashioned term called documentary filmmaking. Uh, which comes in and out of style and came back in style when, it was, uh, when people started calling it reality television. So I'm you know, good to go with that. If you want to call it reality television, I'm all for it. Well, thanks for watching E's Inside Look at What is a Producer. And if you decide to go into the business, you'd be wise to remember what we've learned. You'll be even wiser if you're prepared to work as hard as the people we've met. Just do me a favor and pay closer attention to the credits the next time you see a film or watch a television show. And remember, a producer brought all those people together. As E Channel, they want to know what a producer does. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. You have 30 seconds. Even my mom asks, you know, and exactly what did you do on that movie? Nobody knows, including his wife. Well, Laura comes in around 11, oh, and she leaves around 4. I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. I kind believe the fifth. fifth job, right? <laughs> and then she, she'll come by. We'll see her, and she, she'll say hello to everybody, or most everybody, whatever there's time for. She'll get lunch, see some dailies, uh, take a nap in the trailer. Tell then we'll you see her wrong. again around right. four. She'll have some comments, yeah. <laughs> no, tell them what to do. Something. I can't do this. <laughs> then uh, around five, there's usually some very important dinner she has to attend. I'm sure it has to do with this movie. And then we'll see her again, uh, if not the next day, then shortly thereafter. This is really new. Really <laughs> 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 Thank you, Sam. <laughs>